Hello everybody and welcome to this talk, but this is a talk with a different, because there's no audience here. This is purely a recording. Helen Cook gave last year two talks on Joseph Priestley, one on his life, early life, and his life in Nantwich, and then another talk about his later life, which of course is the bit that everybody knows about in the far as they know him at all. So today she combined these two talks to make this recording so it can be put up on the RSC YouTube channel for everybody to enjoy. So without further ado, I hand over to Helen Cook to give us a wonderful talk on Joseph Priestley, the cover of Oxygen. Over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, do this combined talk uh, for hopefully um, a fairly uh, uh, extensive audience uh, for the Royal Society of Chemistry and beyond. As well as being a chemist and a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry's Historical Group Committee, I'm also on a couple of other committees for the RSE, and uh, I'm a volunteer at Nantwich Museum in Cheshire in England. And um, Joseph Priestley have lived in this town from 1758 to 1761, which partly explains my interest in him. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning. Where was Priestley born? And, um, and I'll talk about his early life and I'll then move on in, in chronological order really through, throughout his life. So Priestley was born at Fieldhead near Burstall in Yorkshire, in this house that you can see on the screen at the moment. Burstall is about six miles or 10 kilometers southwest of Leeds. And Joseph Priestley was the son of Mary Swift and Jonas Priestley, his father obviously, and uh, Jonas Priestley was a cloth finisher and he was uh, involved in the textile manufacturing business. So cloth finishing is the process that converts woven or knitted cloth into a usable material. The house pictured is uh, now demolished. People in the UK may recognize this statue. Uh, it's located in Burstall, which is fairly close to Priestley's birthplace. And this is where in 2016, the local MP, Joe Cox, was tragically murdered. Now, as soon as I saw this picture on the TV uh, and it was surrounded by wreaths and people paying their respects and so on to Joe Cox, uh, I immediately thought, aha, there's uh, Joseph Priestley um, pictured on the television in uh, not particularly, uh, well, uh, very, very uh, unhappy circumstances, of course, at the time. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about um, Joseph Priestley's early life. And he was born into a Congregationalist family. So these, um, these, these are a non-conformist um, um, a, a branch of, uh, of, of religion in England at the time. And uh, he was the eldest of six children. His mother died when Joseph was only six years old. And he was subsequently adopted by his aunt, Sarah Keithley, and his uncle, John Priestley. Now, John Priestley, of course, was Jonas's, uh, was Jonas's brother. Unfortunately, John Priestley died when Joseph was only 12 years old. Joseph was, um, as a child, he was a rather sickly child and he was a bit weak and uh, consumptive and he also had a stammer. Now, according to his memoirs, and I should say that his memoirs, uh, we have to be very grateful to Joseph Priestley for writing his memoirs because they provide a wealth of information, of course, straight from, uh, straight from his own mouth although they were written quite some time after, um, towards the end of his life. So a lot of what I'm talking about now, um, he recorded it um, a number of decades after, after, um, uh, after the events actually took place. So um, <clears throat> at the age of 11, uh, Joseph performed his first scientific experiment. And in this experiment, he confined spiders in bottles to see how long they could live without fresh air. Now, I'm not sure, of course, whether he actually had science in mind at the time. It's nice to think that perhaps he did. But on the other hand, he might just have been behaving like an inquisitive schoolboy uh, and messing around with, uh, with, with insects and so on in matchboxes and everything else, although they wouldn't have um, been around at the time. He had to have time off school, um, during which he wasn't idle. Uh, he taught himself various languages during this time period. And um, on the screen, I've listed some of them there. So French, Italian, and uh, High Dutch, which in fact is German, but he refers to, but it was known as High Dutch at the time, and that's how Priestley referred to it in his, in his uh, memoirs. Priestley's widowed Aunt Sarah 
was very fond of Priestley. She was fond of Priestley in the extreme, um, he says in his memoirs, and he was a formative influence on him. Aunt Sarah was a Calvinist who opened up her house to preachers and students of the Calvinist persuasion. And from childhood, Joseph mixed with people who debated radical religious ideas, including those of uh, other nonconformists and dissenters. So this kind of opened his mind, I think, from a very early age. And, and he was obviously receptive to participating in these kinds of discussions. To quote from Priestley's autobiography, his aunt Sarah, um, her commitment showed quietly, but without bigotry. Okay, so um, I thought at this point I would introduce a map. Now this map was designed by um, Keith Harper, who's a member of Nantwich Museum Research Group. And we used this during an exhibition that we put on at the museum uh, back in 2019. And it's a map of Joseph Priestley's travels. Now, as it was uh, designed for the exhibition that was taking place in Nantwich, and of course Nantwich featured very heavily in this particular exhibition, the, uh, the, the, the arrows are in a different color from the time of his birth until the time he got to Nantwich. Uh, and then they move on um, to, to red. They're blue, obviously, in the first, first part of his life. And then they move on to red when he's moved away from Nantwich later on in his life. Now, if you're interested in the exhibition, there is a QR code on this screen. And this takes you to the muse museum's um, exhibition, information about the exhibition. And, uh, and the information panels and other, other information um, concerned with Joseph Priestley and also the periodic table because this exhibition took place in 2019, which was the international year of the periodic table. Uh, so we, we were celebrating that as well as uh, celebrating Joseph Priestley's time in Nantwich. So this map, um, was actually reproduced in a new edition of Priestley's memoirs that's only been out for less than a year, I think. And this new edition was compiled by the Priestley House Museum in Pennsylvania, USA. Now, I have absolutely no commercial interest in this, but I have a copy and it's a really excellent publication, very nicely illustrated and organized with interpretive notes at the end and a very helpful um, list of the, uh, the, the people in Joseph's life as well. Uh, which which mean, makes it a very useful uh, publication to refer to for anyone who's reading his memoirs or studying Priestley um, by any other means. It's also very modestly priced and it can be purchased online through the usual online um, retailers. So I will come back to this map and I will also show the link again later on if you haven't managed to catch it this time and, and if you're interested. So when Priestley had finished at school, and he did attend uh, several private schools during his youth, as, as well as um, having to teach himself um, when, he was, when he was at home feeling unwell. Um, but when he had finished at school, uh, Joseph Priestley, uh, uh, it, it was decided that he would go to um, Daventry Academy to study for three years to prepare for joining the ministry. Because religion was a very, very, very important part of Joseph Priestley's life, as it was for the rest of his family as well. Now, in Priestley's time, religious freedom was increasing, although dissenters, such as Priestley and his family, had fewer civil rights than members of the Church of England. For example, dissenters weren't allowed to go to the universities of Oxford or Cambridge because they only accepted Anglicans. For that matter, Catholics weren't actually admitted either, so uh, it wasn't just the, the, uh, the dissenters. So dissenters decided to set up their own academies, and Daventry was one of these. They provided education um, at a very high level, and, and people say that this was at the same kind of level as Oxford and Cambridge provided. And they encouraged students to, to discuss things and weigh up evidence and think for themselves. Um, perhaps the kind of thing that Priestley was a, a little bit uh, um, accustomed to because of his interactions with the visitors that came to his aunt Sarah's house. The ideas of the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason had great influence at this time and modern science described at the time as natural philosophy uh, was just beginning. Concerning Priestley's religious beliefs, when he moved to Daventry he considered himself to be an Arminian but by the time he left Daventry, he considered himself to be an Arian. 
Now, it all gets very confusing with all these different um, branches of nonconformism at the time, but the best way to describe Priestley is probably as a heterodox, a term which is used to describe people who held different religious opinions from the standard beliefs and teachings of the time. After he graduated from Daventry, Priestley was appointed as a minister to the elderly John Meadows at a nonconformist chapel in Needham Market in Suffolk, England. Priestley was a non-Trinitarian, so in other words, he didn't believe in the three in one, the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. And it turned out that this was really a little bit too radical for the beliefs of the congregation, which drifted away, unfortunately, and he ended up with so few members that only occasional preaching was possible at the chapel. Now Meadows became so hostile that he ensured that Priestley wasn't paid his promised salary. And he actually had to seek help from his family. His aunt Sarah was, uh, was quite benevolent in these kinds of circumstances when Priestley was uh, suffering financially. He was more popular amongst the townsfolk in general though, and he made a number of friends in the area and was given free use of the town's library. The chapel was built in 1718, and the painting you can see here was done by a local artist in 1833. And uh, you can kind of tell what, which era it came from, where it comes from, because um, the Victorian clothing um, that people are wearing in the picture. The original is in the, in the new United Reformed Church, which is on the same site as uh, Priestley's Chapel was. And uh, I was privileged to have seen the painting um, when I visited. Uh, uh, a few years ago when I was doing research and a very nice lady at the, um, at the new, uh, the new um, United Reformed Church um, showed me around and showed me various artifacts and so on that they still had that were concerned with Joseph Priestley. This is a picture of the new church. It's known as Christ Church and um, in the guidebook it says that Priestley's talents, and I quote from this, lay in the sphere of philosophy and science rather than in religion on which his views were quite unorthodox and years in advance of his time. I think this is quite a telling statement and probably says quite a lot about um, Joseph Priestley in his relative youth still whilst he was in Needham Market. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to Joseph Priestley's time in Nantwich. And uh, I do apologize uh, that uh, there is a little bit more emphasis perhaps than there should be on Nantwich. And this is because of my personal interest and also uh, because we did a lot of work when we were preparing for the exhibition in, uh, in 2019. So after a rather unhappy time, his rather unhappy time at Needham Market, Priestley's next appointment was here in Nantwich and it arose um, via a relative of his mother, uh, a Mr Gill, who was a minister in Apple, Upper Chapel in Sheffield. Now, Priestley's family were aware that he wasn't happy in Needham, and I'm sure they were on the lookout for new opportunities for him uh, to move away from Nantwich, from, um, from Needham Market. Anyway, Mr. Gill arranged for Priestley to preach as a candidate for a position at Upper Chapel, but uh, he wasn't actually appointed. But there was another minister there, a Mr. Haynes, who knew that a minister was needed in Nantwich, and Priestley successfully applied for this and moved to Nantwich in September 1758. This picture, by the way, um, is the closest I could find of Priestley uh, to the time that he was in Nantwich. So this is uh, from 1763. So it probably gives a reasonable idea of what he would have looked about looked like at the time he was in um, the Nantw in Nantwich. Now, well, when preparing for the 29 exhibition, 2019 exhibition at the museum, we did quite a lot of research into where Priestley lived because. Believe it or not, we don't really know exactly where he lived um, and we, we didn't know before we started this research and we still weren't 100% sure after we'd finished it either. So still an opportunity for, work, for further research to go on um, about this. But a few of the pictures, a few of the options are pictured here. Now the picture on the left is, is of Sweetbriar Hall, which is a Tudor building in the town and a plaque is displayed on the front of the building, which states definitively that this is where Priestley lived. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to prove this. The picture in the centre is of a former school building, and this was built around 1701, and it's located close to Sweetbriar Hall, just to the rear of Sweetbriar Hall. It's tantalisingly named Priestley House, although the name plaque does look very new. This is possibly just wishful thinking on the part of the owner, unfortunately. 
But the strongest evidence is for the building on the right, which is known locally as the Queen's Aid House. And there's a whole story behind that, which I won't go into today, but um, Priestley is known to have lodged with a gentleman by the name of John Eddowes, who was succeeded by another person from the Eddowes family, who's called Eddowes Bowman, who is known to have had his business as a grocer and tobacconist in the Queen's Aid House in, in 1792. Now, we know um, that that is some time after Priestley left Nantwich, of course, but we also know from Priestley's memoirs that John Eddowes taught Priestley to play the flute. By, and by Priestley's own admission, he wasn't particularly proficient at it, although he did recognize, recommend the practice of music to all studious persons. Eddowes Bowman, um, who had his business in, in the Queen's Aid House, later on in life purchased Sweetbriar Hall in 1814, hence the possible confusion. So we know, uh, we, we know that um, Priestley lodged with uh, John Eddowes, and there was obviously a strong connection with the family, but um, we don't actually think that Sweetbriar Hall is uh, where Priestley lived. But let's see, the jury is still out to some extent on that one. The chapel where Priestley preached, because he was appointed as a minister, of course, uh, the chapel where he preached was built in 1726 and it was demolished in, six, in 1969 um, to 70, that sort of time period. Now, when the chapel was built, it was Presbyterian, but it later became Unitarian. Now, Unitarianism didn't really become uh, <clears throat> in, come into force until around about 1774 in London, it was established. And, uh, and so, of course, this again was after Priestley's time in Nantwich. There's a plaque on the wall, which is circled in red on the slide, which states, in remembrance of Joseph Priestley, LLD, born 1733, died 1804, minister of this chapel, 1758 to 1761, discoverer of oxygen, pioneer of our faith. Whilst at the chapel, Priestley's congregation, who were much more receptive to uh, his views and his doctrines than uh, the people at Needham Market, they um, they, it was comprised of about 60 regular members and rarely exceeded this during his stay. Many of the congregation shared Priestley's more liberal theology. The Orthodox members had actually left during the previous ministry, so perhaps a similar situation to Needham um, uh, existed at Nantwich prior to Priestley's arrival um, in Nantwich. Many of the congregation members were travelling Scottish men, mostly packmen. Now Priestley's mystery, ministerial duties were quite a bit lighter than they had been in, uh, in Needham. But when he was in Needham, he'd written a lot of sermons, and so he was doing about one per week. So he had plenty of uh, opportunities to reuse sermon, sermons when he was in Nantwich. And this, this left him with more time for the activities of his school, uh, because he did establish a school in Nantwich as well. In fact, in Nantwich, Priestley was really more of a teacher than a preacher. <clears throat> so this is uh, an artist's impression of what Joseph Priestley's school might have looked like. And this painting, uh, this is a, a photograph of a painting which was put together by Les Pickford, who is Nantwich Museum's artist. And um, Priestley established his school soon after he arrived, and contrary to his expectations, he actually really quite enjoyed teaching. The other schools in Nantwich um, weren't open to dissenting families and had limited curricula, and nonconformists probably travelled a fair distance for their children to attend the school. The schoolhouse was demolished in 1743 and it was on the same site as the chapel. It was a black and white building and as you probably recall from the, uh, the pictures of, of Nantwich we looked at just now, um, that was quite common. There are a lot of Tudor buildings in uh, Nantwich and uh, so this was obviously one of them, the schoolhouse in, um, in Nantwich where Priestley, Priestley taught. In Nantwich he was already showing signs of his creativity and laying the foundations for his future scientific work. He was, in fact, you could consider him even to be a pioneer of science outreach. And uh, he says in his memoirs that uh, his, his school soon enabled him to purchase a few books and some philosophical instruments, such as a small air pump, an electrical machine, etc. And he said, goes on to say that he taught his scholars in the highest class to keep in order these instruments and make use, and make use of them by entertaining their parents and friends with experiments. In, in, in which the scholars were generally operators and sometimes the lecturers too. He also says that he had no other object originally than gratifying his own tastes and no leisure 
to make any original experiments until many, many years after this time. His stammer, uh, which was one of his impediments uh, as a child particularly, um, stayed with him. And he does claim that he was able to overcome this to some degree in Nantwich um, by speaking loudly and uh, practicing, I think, is, is the solution that he found. And he managed to improve um, his, his confidence and uh, reduce the impact of his stammer. Priestley also advocated the education of women. And he wrote, certainly the minds of women are capable of the same improvement as those of men. Now, this may seem a little bit patronizing nowadays, but actually it was quite advanced thinking for the time. In this picture, he's, uh, he's uh, another painting done by Les Pickford, uh, the artist from the museum. He's pictured with an air pump, similar to the type de uh, developed by Boyle and Hook in the mid 17th century. And uh, here he is in his classroom uh, with the girls who were taught in a separate classroom. I think he had 30, he had about 30 uh, boys and about half a dozen young ladies who he taught in a separate room. So according to David Wykes in a chapter in a, in a 2008 book about Priestley, uh, Joseph Priestley, scientist, philosopher and theologian is the title of the book. And um, the quote is that his reputation as a teacher rest, rests on his school in Nantwich. After the school teaching day finished, he went off to an, a, an affluent family that lived nearby, probably supplemented his in, income quite nicely, I should think. And he taught privately until seven o'clock in the evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, his early um, published works now. In fact, this one wasn't published uh, uh, terribly early, this theological repository um, um, paper that he produced. Um, a lot of the pictures, the original pictures of the original documents, by the way, came from archive.org, uh, sometimes Google Books, and also the Wellcome Collection. And without these kinds of sources, uh, research of this type, especially, um, especially during a pandemic, um, is, uh, would have been a lot more difficult when it's not been so easy to get to libraries and so on. Anyway, um, Priestley was a really prolific writer, and uh, he says that... Um, in his memoirs that his engagements at teaching in Nantwich allowed him little time for composing anything, but he did recompose this publication, the observations on the character and reasoning of the Apostle Paul. And this was a publication he'd been working on at Needham Market, uh, which he'd been dissuaded from publishing until he was more known and his character was better established. He was also advised not to publish his observations under his own name as they would have, as as they wouldn't have been take, taken seriously, apparently. People didn't like non-conformists being critical of major religious figures. And of course, uh, Paul, St. Paul would have been a, a major uh, religious uh, figure. In 1761, shortly after Priestley, after Priestley left Nantwich, he published his uh, Rudiments of English Grammar. This was when he was in Warrington, his next position, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. And uh, this was a really important work, actually. It, it ran to very many editions and it was used until the 19th century. Apparently it's still refer referred to today in linguistics courses. So Priestley's publications overall, they uh, reflected his many interests and they included uh, religion, theology, descent, education, science, philosophy, and uh, politics. So he was a true polymath uh, with, with um, um, many, many interests. Over the years, he updated and revised many of his works and his output on religion, in fact, greatly exceeded that of science, even though he's mainly remembered for his science um, amongst the general population. At the age of 28, Joseph Priestley was invited to take up the position of tutor in languages and polite learning at uh, the uh, dissenting academy in Warrington, which he accepted and he stayed for six years. He wasn't a minister at Warrington, he was purely involved with um, teaching and education. But while he was there, he was ordained on the 18th of May in 1762. The academy building uh, was next to the bridge over the River Mersey at a location appropriately named Bridgefoot. In May 18, 1981, the building was moved uh, due to road widening and it was enclosed in a steel frame sliced from the foundations and moved on rollers to an adjacent vacant spot. And later it was substantially remodeled to form the offices of the Warrington Guardian newspaper. Essentially only one original room remains today. 
At this point, I really must uh, thank um, a, a former colleague of mine at, um, uh, at UMIST. I used to work at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. And a colleague of mine, Joe Lee, uh, was very interested in uh, Joseph Priestley. And um, he, uh, he also um, uh, did some quite a lot of research and he was a, particularly about Warrington. And so he was able to provide me with a lot of information for, um, for, this, uh, for this talk and for the exhibition that we were doing at uh, Nantwich Museum as well. When the Academy was launched in October, 1757, there were only five students but numbers soon increased with students coming from all parts of Britain and overseas. The Academy became a highly esteemed establishment. The students were of course all male, perhaps um, it wasn't uh, uh, not quite the same as uh, in Nantwich where the, uh, where the, the uh, girls were taught in the school. Around 1766, under a strong influence from Priestley, the curriculum changed substantially to include subjects relevant to industry and commerce, very important in the geographic area, of course, where Priestley was living. Uh, and as well as industry and commerce, these, well, these included chemistry, history, and anatomy. In 2002, Norman Rose of Birmingham University said, over a period of six years, Priestley so modernized and improved education there that Warrington became the finest center of educational excellence in the known world, outstripping even those theological university establishments of Oxford and Cambridge. Priestley was a highly effective teacher and education innovator. The statue pictured, and the large statue pictured, uh, is located at Priestley College in Warrington and was the original plaster model created by Francis Darlington just over 100 years ago as the precursor for the bronze statue at Burstall, which we saw in an earlier slide and which I've got a little, little picture of um, top right uh, on this slide as well. And you can see, I think, that even though they're, they're taken from, the pictures are taken from a slightly different angle, uh, clearly there is a similarity there. Uh, so again, um, thanks to Joe Lee for these some of these pictures. And uh, he was also the uh, vice chair of the now dissolved UK Priestly Society. I meant to mention that, um, that before. So while at Warrington, uh, a very, it was, this kind of was a turning point in Priestley's career. While at Warrington, he extended his, he has extended his connections with influential and learned people. So I've got ringed um, or in a box here, um, the three people who were particularly influential on him at the time. So um, we've got uh, John Canton, who was an English experimenter and physicist, and he introduced Priestley to Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Richard Price was a Welsh moral philosopher, a non-conformist preacher and a mathematician. And uh, not mentioned here, but another person who uh, had a big influence on Priestley was Matthew Turner, the Liverpool physician who visited Warrington, Warrington Academy to lecture on chemistry. And this perhaps can be credited with the event which started Priestley's interest in philosophical pursuits, uh, otherwise known as science. The, uh, the article also, the article pictured here, section of which is pictured here, also discusses Priestley's election to the Royal Society. So Benjamin Franklin, Franklin, no doubt everybody's uh, familiar with um, Franklin. Uh, he lived from 1706 to 1790 and was one of the founding fathers of the USA and a leading author, political theorist and inventor who Priestley met at the Royal Society in London. Uh, and as you can imagine, Franklin did have a very significant influence on Priestley. In 1766, Priestley decided to write a history of electricity up to that date. John Canton, Benjamin Franklin and others encouraged Priestley to perform the experiments he was writing about in his history um, himself, because they believed this would enable him to better describe the experiments um, rather than just um, stating what other people had done. In the process of replicating others' experiments, Priestley became intrigued by the still unanswered questions regarding electricity and was prompted to design, his, um, to de design and undertake his own um, experiments. The history included fam the famous kite experiment in which a kite with a pointed conductive wire attached to its apex is flown near to thunderclouds or as close as you can get to thunderclouds, I suppose, from ground level to collect electricity from the air and conduct it down the wet kite string to the ground. 
Um, this was actually uh, proposed by Benjamin Franklin and may well have been done by him too. It all sounds decidedly hazardous to me, but um, this, is, uh, this is something that um, Priestley uh, talks about in his history. Priestley designed a machine to produce static electricity. Now, of course, at the time there were no batteries or electricity generators, so static electricity was uh, what he was experimenting with. And this picture is from Priestley's, another publication by Priestley, for his familiar introduction to the study of electricity, which he published in 1768. Priestley's work on electricity led to him being awarded his FRS in 1766. Another important work, uh, whilst um, Priestley was in Warrington, he completed uh, this um, chart, specimen of a chart of biography, um, which, he, which he dedicated to Benjamin Franklin. This was designed to show the overlap of eminent historical figures. He started work on it in Nantwich and used it as a teaching tool. It includes uh, statesmen, mathematicians, poets, critics, historians, etc. So you could see the overlap of people in specific periods. Um, and I think this is actually rather, rather interesting. And I guess at the time would have perhaps been quite um, a, 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 a radical and new approach. Well-known people you may be able to spot include Socrates. Um, here's Socrates, we've got Aristotle, Plato, um, and, and various others that you can see across, uh, across the screen here. Hannibal's there and Julius Caesar as well. The publication on the, of the chart led to Priestley being awarded his LLD from Uni University of Edinburgh as well. And he later did a similar chart for history, which he published in 1769. That was after he left Warrington. In 1762, Mary, uh, Priestley married Mary, uh, the daughter of Isaac Wilkinson, an ironmaster from the Wrexham area. Mary's, the way they, they got to meet each other was because Mary's brother, William, attended Priestley School in Nantwich. And this is partly why I say, said earlier on that, um, that the nonconformists probably travelled quite some way to get to the Nantwich School because uh, uh, Wrexham is, is about 20 miles from Nantwich. So that was quite a long journey um, back in Priestley's time. Joseph and Mary went on to have four children, William, Sarah, Joseph and Henry. And after she had passed away, because um, she predeceased him by a few years, of Mary Priestley said, she was of a noble and generous mind and cared much for others and little for herself throughout life. If you want to learn more about the Wilkinson family, as, uh, they can certainly, you can find out plenty of information about them in publications, but um, something I found very interesting was a visit to museums in Ironbridge in Shropshire, uh, where the, we the Wilkinsons do feature quite um, prominently. Now Mary's uh, health was chronic, causing a certain amount of concern at Warrington, and um, they moved uh, to Mill Hill Chapel in Leeds in 1767, where Priestley was appointed a minister. So he's flip-flopping a little bit because he's, he went from being a minister in Needham teacher and minister in Nantwich, um, back to teaching in Warrington, now he's in Leeds and he's very much a minister again. And um, he received uh, a stipend of uh, 100 guineas uh, whilst, he was, um, whilst he was in uh, Leeds. The couple lived in the minister's house north of the chapel and at this point he returned to the serious theological study. Whilst in Leeds he co-founded the Leeds Library and also the infirmary. And the blue plaque that you can see on the screen is situated on the Victorian replacement chapel. And apparently there's a chair in the chapel that belonged to Priestley. I haven't visited the chapel, so I, I can't corroborate that, but that is, um, that is what they say on the website for the chapel. This statue of Priestley is in Leeds City Square and it overlooks the uh, new chapel. Whilst at Mill Hill, Priestley's controversial political and religious views were becoming known. And in 1769, he met Theophilus Lindsay, who was the, re the rector at the time of Catterick in Yorkshire. They became close, lifelong friends, and between them um, established the first avowedly Unitarian congregation in Essex Street in London. 
and Benjamin Franklin was the first was at the ser first service of the Essex Street Chapel at the time. Priestley Priest is therefore considered a founder of Unitarianism in England. Now, while at Mill Hill, Priestley still managed to find time for science. It was funny how he always did wherever he seemed to go. He lived next door to a brewery where there was a plentiful su supply of carbon dioxide produced through the fermenting process. Now, carbon dioxide at the time was known as fixed air, and it was first discovered by Joseph Black in the 1750s. Priestley found that the air acidified, um, the, the, he called the air fixed air, by the way, and he found uh, that the air acidified and sweetened ordinary water, and that the water impregnated with the fixed air became fizzy. So therefore he can be credited with inventing soda water, even though he didn't actually commercialize it at the time. If he had, you never know, he might have become a lot richer. Priestley presented a paper on this to the Royal Society and was awarded the Copley Medal for his work. The experimental details of creating a solution of carbon dioxide in water to produce the soda water is described in this 1772 publication. He also postulated that eating CO2 rich vegetables could prevent scurvy, and this was tested for efficacy on one of Captain Cook's voyages. Now, I'm not sure of the outcomes. Mill Hill Chapel's website proudly states that during his time in Leeds, Priestley's research led him to the discovery of, the, of oxygen in 1774. Here's a section of the experimental details, along with the apparatus that Priestley used. They're also included in one of Priestley's most famous works, his experiments and observations on, on different kinds of air, which was published in several volumes between 1774 and 1786. And I'm going to say more about this later. Priestley took advantage of the availability of the fixed air in the brewery and explored its properties. He says, one might have imagined that since common air is necessary to vegetable as well as to animal life, both plants and animals had affected it in the same manner. And I own that I had that, expe that expectation when I first put a sprig of mint into a glass jar, standing inverted in, in a vessel of water. But when it had continued growing there for some months, I found that the air would neither extinguish a candle, nor was it at all inconvenient to a mouse, which I put into it. So he was confirming one of the properties of carbon dioxide. This picture shows a demonstration created by uh, one of Nantwich Museum's research group members for our 2019 exhibition, uh, in which um, he used pondweed in the water, but it's basically replicating the same, uh, same experiment that, um, that uh, Priestley did. If you look very closely, you can see uh, bubbles here just above the pondweed. So it proved that it was, uh, it was actually working. And this was uh, found to be of, quite, of great interest um, to children who visited Nantwich Museum at the time. Moving on to Priestley's next location, he was recommended to Lord Shelburne by Richard Price, who, we, uh, who I introduced a few slides ago. Um, and uh, Priestley had obviously known Richard Price since Warrington. Shelburne was the leader of the Liberal group in the Whig party at the time. And it was an offer that Priestley couldn't refuse uh, it included a better salary. Uh, his role was librarian and literary companion, and he taught Lord Shelburne's sons and also helped uh, Shelburne himself by preparing parliamentary information for him. Shelburne was a supportive patron and he was very interested in Priestley's science activities, and the two of them remained good friends after Priestley less calm, left calm. Uh, Shelburne paid Priestley an annuity for his, the rest of his life, which actually um, was very, very useful for him when he hit harder times later on. Lord Shelburne built a lab for Priestley, and it was while in Cowell in 1774 that he discovered oxygen, which he called deflogisticated air. This is a picture of Priestley's lab, which appears in experiments and observations of different kinds of air in, uh, in 1775. Priestley was a believer in the theory of phlogiston, as most people were at the time, which originated in 1669 with German chemist George Ernst Dahl. The theory postulated that the existence of a fire-like substance, phlogiston, was contained within combustible materials 
and released during combustion. Priestley experimented by heating red oxide of mercury or mercury kelp in a glass tube using a burn burning glass. And a burning glass is a double convex lens. And this focused the sunlight onto the oxide. According to the theory, the phlogiston theory, the mercury kelp was assumed to be mercury or, or mercury metal, which was lacking phlogiston. Heating it generated mercury metal, meaning that phlogiston from the surrounding air in the tube must have been taken up by the calx. So according to Priestley, the residual air in the tube would then become dephlogisticated air and would be able to take up more phlogiston than the same amount of ordinary air. In other words, things would burn more brightly in dephlogisticated air since they could give up their phlogiston more readily. Also, uh, he concluded that, um, that, that, that the, um, the dephlogisticated air should be able to support life for longer. Priestley's experiments confirmed both of these things, but the phlogiston theory, of course, was incorrect. When Priestley discovered oxygen, he knew that it was a new kind of air. The first public announcement was made on the 23rd of March, 1774 when his letter that he wrote on the 15th of March telling of what he had done was read to its recipient, Sir John Pringle, uh, sorry, read by um, its recipient, John Pringle, to the Royal Society. And uh, he briefly states that it's the most remarkable of all the kinds of air that I have produced. It's five or six times better than common air for the purpose of inflammation, respiration, and I believe every other use of common atmospheric air. As I think I have sufficiently proved that the fitness for air of air for respiration depends on its capacity to receive the phlogiston exhale, exhaled from lungs, this species may not improperly be called dephlogisticated air. And this work was published in Philosophical Transactions, which is the Royal Society's journal. Priestley isn't the only person who can be credited with discovering um, dephlogisticated air or discovering oxygen. Another contender was Swedish apothecary Carl Wilhelm Scheele, who discovered oxygen a few years before Priestley by heating a mixture of potassium nitrate, known at the time as nitre or saltpeter, and sulfuric acid, known as oil of vitriol. He called it fire air. Scheele wrote to Lavoisier explaining his findings, but his results were not published until 1777, after Priestley and Lavoisier Lavoisier had both reported theirs. Priestley was the first to discover, uh, to publish his discovery, and so he, he gets the credit over and above Scheele quite a lot of the time. Shortly after his discovery, Priestley travelled around Europe with Lord Shelburne, including to Paris, where he met Antoine Lavoisier. And of course, Antoine Lavoisier is widely considered to be the founder of modern chemistry. Lavoisier went on to replicate Priestley's experiment. And he renamed, renamed the, ga the gas oxygen at the same time dismissing the theory of phlogiston. All three, Scheele, Priestley and Lavoisier, can be considered to be discoverers of oxygen. Priestley's discoveries of gases and experiments are recorded in his most famous publication, which I've referred to several times already, six volume work entitled Experiments and Observations on Different Kinds of Air published between 1774 and 1786. The pneumatic trough pictured here allowed gases to be collected and stored over mercury or water. And Priestley's work with this uh, led to the isolation of hydrochloric acid and ammonia, and um, he made great use of it in uh, his work going forward. Priestley didn't discover all the gases listed here, but he did experiment with them. Joseph Black discovered carbon dioxide in the 1750s. Henry Cavendish discovered oxygen in 1766. Um, the others, a lot of the others in the experimental work that Priestley did are mentioned in his Experiments and Observations publication. What we've done in this table is include Priestley's name, the modern name, um, the date in which he either discovered it or uh, was, was doing his, the bulk of his, his uh, experimental work, the formula and then a little molecular model on the right hand side as well. Humphrey Davy stated of Priestley, no other person ever discovered so many new and curious substances. 
After Calm, Priestley moved to Birmingham, taking up a position as a minister. This statue is in Chamberlain Square, Birmingham. Priestley took a pay cut uh, when he went to Birmingham, but um, he had the annuity from Lord Shelburne, which really helped, and he was also helped by his brother-in-law, who provided him with a house. Other people gave him scientific equipment, scientific equipment and, and paid his household expenses. While in Birmingham, Priestley published several scientific papers, mostly trying to refute Lavoisier's new chemistry. But most of his publications whilst he was there were theological. His career and reputation were destroyed by the Birmingham Theological Establishment's reaction to his polemics. I'll say more in a moment or two about those, but he expressed his anger uh, at the uh, anger against the corruptions of Christianity. He'd written challenging criticisms of Orthodox Christianity, um, but his motive was reform, not attack. But he was really uh, um, misunderstood, I think, at that time. Priestley became a member of the Lunar Society, a group of like-minded progressives who met near the time of the full moon to exchange ideas. Other members of the Lunar Society, there were many eminent people, of course, but uh, Josiah Wedgwood and uh, James Watt were a couple of people um, that you have probably heard of. Meetings were usually at Soho House in the home of Matthew, Matthew Bolton. And this house is now a museum which celebrates Bolton's life. It also celebrates his partnership with other members of the Lunar Society, uh, including Priestley. Oh, sorry, I went forward a little bit further than I intended to there. Um, Matthew, yes, so uh, Matthew Bolton, the list on the right uh, is just, oh, well, I was going to say it was the list on the right is some of the other members of the Lunar Society, and you'll recognize those. And um, uh, also um, his partnership with James Watt um, was featured in the, uh, in the is, is featured in the museum, um, and um, his contributions to the Midlands Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution are also mentioned too. Increasingly, Priestley's political and religious opinions angered many and worried his supporters. His liberal viewpoint led him to support American independence and the French Revolution, uh, and also the ending of the slave trade. In Birmingham on the 14th of July, 1791, the second anniversary of the storming of the Bastille, a mob opposed to the French Revolution rioted in a four day frenzy, often referred to as the Priestley riots. Uh, so named as Priestley was the most prominent target of the local anger. Several buildings, including Priestley's own residence and the new meeting chapel, were built and were burnt and destroyed. The loss of equipment he suffered in, in the Birmingham riots would be about £60,000 at today's value. Priestley was lampooned in many cartoons. British political caricaturist James Gilray, who opposed the French Re Revolution, um, published this cartoon, A Birmingham Toast, uh, as given on the 14th of July, uh, less than a week after the riots ended. It was mocking Priestley in the etching. Priestley is presiding over the toast with a full goblet, offering an empty communion plate and calling for a head, implied to be the kings, among well-known liberals and grim dissenters holding court and this is a harsh uh, parody, really, of The Last Supper. After the riot, Priestley found shelter in London. The family settled uh, in an area, a district of Hackney called Lower Clapton, and Priestley was selected to be the morning preacher at a chapel there known as the Gravel Pit Chapel. He gave a series of lectures on history and natural philosophy at the new, at another dissenting academy, the New College um, Academy in Hackney. Friends helped the couple rebuild their lives, contributing money, books, and uh, laboratory equipment. But this was, he was only there for a couple of years, and there was, this was definitely a less productive period of, of Priestley's life, which is completely understandable, I think, in the circumstances. Priestley tried to obtain restitution from the government for the destruction of his Birmingham property, but he was never fully reimbursed. It was a very sad period in his life, um, and apparently he was spied upon by the government, shunned by the Royal Society, and his sons couldn't find employment. Okay, I'm just going to revisit the map that we looked at earlier on. And um, so you can see we've progressed throughout uh, Priestley's journey, um, starting in Nantwich, going to Needham Market, um, 
sorry, starting at his place of birth, obviously at Mill Hill, going through the Daventry Academy, Needham Market. Um, he went by sea, apparently, for part of that journey because it must have been more straightforward than um, going by, um, by um, coach, which would have been the other alternative. I think also it was cheaper to do that as well. Um, on to Nantwich, then Warrington, Mill Hill uh, in Leeds, um, and then, of course, down to um, Lord Shelburne in Calm, and um, off to uh, Birmingham, uh, then over to, to Hackney to London. And from there, the next phase, the last phase, he gets on a boat and um, makes his way to uh, America. Mary and Joseph decided to move to America and they set off in 1794. And this was partly to escape his difficult situation in England and uh, probably also as his sons had already made the move over there. Uh, one of whom was trying to establish a settlement in a place called Northumberland, Pennsylvania. The family traveled to Northumberland via New York and the journey took about two months. And when they arrived in Philadelphia, which was the capital city at the time, of course, he was welcomed with honor as a scientist, but, uh, but also with dread as a theologian because his reputation uh, preceded him somewhat um, when he arrived. He was offered positions in Philadelphia and elsewhere, but um, he's, he stuck with the idea of Northumberland, partly because, this, because his son was there and also because um, it was likely to be a healthier place for Mary to live. Now, Northumberland is located at the confluence of the north and west branches of the Susquehanna River. And it was at the time a very obscure village comprised of log houses, fewer than a hundred dwellings in total. Priestley held Sunday worship in his home, um, but he had a lab and a library and he was still performing experiments and extending, um, extending his library in the process. So this is, a, this is on a, a sign. I think this one is actually um, in Northumberland and uh, uh, I was uh, privileged to go out there. I lived in Pennsylvania for about seven years and in, uh, in the early 2000s and uh, was able to go out and visit the Joseph Priestley House Museum, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment. Sadly, um, Priestley's, Harry, Priestley's son Harry died in 1795, and Mary, um, his beloved wife, passed away uh, soon afterwards in 1796. He still continued to receive um, his annuities from Lord Shelburne, which must have helped right through the time of his death. Priestley was still writing about phlogiston. He still felt passionately about this um, and was never converted to, um, to, uh, to Lavoisier's new chemistry. And this work that's pictured here was published in Philadelphia in 1797. His house is now the Joseph Priestley House Museum. And it's actually a really good place if you ever get the chance to go. It's a more fitting tribute to Priestley than anything that we have um, in the UK. There was controversy about Priestley's political and theological benefits which followed him from Britain, and he became um, the target of caustic attacks in the US press. He was misunderstood by the people of Northumberland and decided to write uh, letters. He wrote 12 in total to the residents, which explained his religious and political beliefs and expressed his admiration for the US constitution. This slide shows a section of the first letter um, which uh, uh, you can get online. This one was from the um, Welcome Collection. And this is a picture I took whilst I was visiting the Joseph Priestley House. Um, I think that was around about um, 2008. And at this point, I'd just like to thank Tom Bresenham because he, uh, sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, he was a point of contact I had at the Joseph Priestley House Museum. And he was so helpful with providing me with information and also uh, loaned us um, a, an information panel that we were able to display at the exhibition at Nantwich Museum in um, 2019. Priestley died here on the 6th of February, 1804, at the age of 70. So just a little bit more, just to come back to the exhibition, which I said I would mention again, for, in case you didn't catch the QR code at the beginning. Um, if, you, if you can't, if you don't want to do it through the QR code, just go to the Nantwich Museum's website and um, you can navigate to it uh, through that. Um, I also have to uh, thank um, the Nantwich Museum Research Group for their contributions to um, the exhibition and the research that was done, which has contributed to this talk as well. 
we also engaged, while I'm on the matter of thanking people, we also engaged um, people from the Royal Society of Chemistry, various universities and other museums, um, for example, the Wedgwood Museum in Stoke-on-Trent, and consulted uh, archive collections in Warrington and in Oxford. And we did a lot of outreach activities for the, as part of the exhibition, and uh, very pleased that we were able to publish uh, the report of these and the outcomes of these in uh, Journal of Chemical Education um, at the beginning of 2021, this one was published. And the full reference is there, and this QR code takes you to that particular publication. And some of my fellow researchers and contributors that I mentioned um, are listed as the co-authors of this um, paper. Unfortunately, it isn't currently open access, so you do need a subscription to it. Uh, one of the events we, we put on as part of the exhibition uh, was uh, called Joseph Priestley in his Element, and we had several talks. I did a version of this talk that I'm doing today focused on Nantwich, um, and we had a couple of other talks as well. And Dr. Fabio Parmigiani, from, uh, he was from Manchester University, he's now moved to Milan. And in this, we featured a series of live demonstrations of some of, some of Priestley's experiments, which proved very, very popular with the audience. Uh, and don't worry, the picture bottom left, there's a mouse in a jar, which is repeating one of um, Priestley's experiments, but this mouse is not, is not real. So uh, no harm was done to any, any um, mice as part of um, this, uh, this demonstration. Um, again, the, this takes, the, the, the details of these experiments are given as the supporting information in Journal of Chemical Education, um, but have to be accessed via the Journal of Chemical, Chemical Education's website. And finally, just to summarize, uh, what, were, what were Priestley's main achievements? There were so many, weren't there, after all? And so I decided to have a think about what I uh, really think were his key achievements. I think his experiments and observations of different kinds of air was a key, um, such a key publication that that would have to be one of my top five. He was the father of pneumatic chemistry. Um, he was an advocate of civil and religious freedom. He made significant con contributions to education and he discovered so many new substances. And then finally, I'd say his publications generally, including his autobiography, uh, were really um, huge contributions to, um, to his life and to science and philosophy and so on at the time. Robert Craven, um, who um, um, is quoted here, he, uh, he was giving a speech at the bicentenary of Priestley's birth uh, at the Royal, of Institution of, Royal Institute of Chemistry in 1933. And, uh, Craven says, if he were not known as a great chemist, he would still be known as a pioneer of religious and civil liberty. So at that point, um, I want to uh, conclude and I will hand back to Peter. Thank you very much, Helen, for another excellent talk. Um, I'm pleased that you've been able to combine your two unrecorded talks in just an excellent way. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for watching this recording, and, and um, uh, we look forward to perhaps seeing you at some of our future talks. So for now, goodbye, and thank you very much for watching. <laughs>